We spent a bunch of time this year examining the many, many health effects of climate change. And while we've learned a lot about climate change, we haven't talked much about how to address it. And we are clearly interested in that for the sake of public health. So, leaning on the works of climate change experts, we're going to dig into what look like some of the most promising mitigation strategies for the moment. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. The literature on climate change focuses on three main mitigation strategies, conventional mitigation efforts, negative emissions technologies, and radiative forcing geoengineering technologies. That last one's a mouthful, but we'll get to that one shortly. First, the conventional mitigation efforts. These include things like renewable energy, nuclear power, and technologies that capture carbon dioxide emissions to either permanently store or even to create other products like building materials. Some specific examples within this category include electric vehicles using renewable power and use of solar and wind technologies. Importantly, evidence suggests that the types of policies we implement can help or hinder when it comes to driving innovation for each of these. A 2019 paper reported that demand-pull policies, the type that stimulate demand for innovation via incentives, are most effective at fostering innovation in renewable technologies. In addition, policies won't be one-size-fits-all. A study of factors that can hinder or enable the development of renewable energy projects in the European Union revealed that the same factors can have vastly different impacts in different places. For capturing and storing carbon dioxide, pre-combustion, post-combustion, and oxy-fuel combustion are the three capturing technologies, and it looks like post-combustion capture technologies are the best option for retrofitting projects, think like existing power plants. Once captured, the carbon dioxide is liquefied and moved to storage sites like depleted oil and gas fields and coal beds. This, of course, draws concern about leakage, and it can be somewhat costly. According to one 2020 paper, only two carbon capture and storage projects are actually operating as of 2018, with nine more projects under development. The second strategy, negative emissions technologies, includes techniques such as bioenergy carbon capture and storage, and afforestation and reforestation, to name just a couple. Importantly, these technologies are meant to complement conventional mitigation efforts, not replace them. Bioenergy carbon capture and storage happens when carbon dioxide is captured by biomass during growth and then used for energy production via combustion, with the carbon dioxide emissions being captured and stored. Some examples of biomass that can be suitably used for this purpose include discarded material from forestry resources, think wood from trees, or dedicated crops. For this approach to be effective, large amounts of biomass are required, which raises some concerns about demand on other resources like water and land. This kind of technology on the scale needed is still in early stages of development, so there are several factors that still need to be worked out for it to be viable mitigation strategy. Afforestation and reforestation are basically just what they sound like, either establishing new forests or reestablishing areas that have been previously deforested. This makes a difference because carbon dioxide is captured and stored by trees as they grow. This does require a lot of land, and while carbon can be stored for quite some time in the forest, it can also be easily disturbed by things like fires and human activity. Where the forests are located matters too. Tropical areas are preferred for increased forestation, whereas higher latitude should be avoided because more trees could replace reflective snow cover and alter the fraction of sunlight that's reflected, which can actually accelerate warming. The great thing about this mitigation effort is that it's already been used a lot. It doesn't cause the same concerns as collecting and storing carbon in underground locations. The concerns that do exist here are mainly centered around cost and land availability. The third strategy, radiative forcing geoengineering technologies aim to stabilize or reduce temperatures without altering concentrations of greenhouse gases. The names of some of these techniques are pretty wild to us as non-experts, including things like stratospheric aerosol injection, marine sky brightening, and space-based mirrors. But essentially, the goal of each is to alter the Earth's radiative energy. Let's break down a couple of the techniques. Stratospheric aerosol injection essentially aims to mimic the cooling effect seen with really big volcanic eruptions. Such eruptions eject literal tons of sulfur dioxide gas, which has the nice effect of reducing global temperatures by reflecting sunlight back into space. Thus, 
intentional delivery of sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere is a potential geoengineered approach to addressing climate change. Potential downsides of this approach. It's kind of expensive, and we aren't totally sure how it would affect the rest of the Earth, so that's kind of a big deal. Marine sky brightening is essentially the enhancement of cloud reflectivity to reduce global temps. This involves creating little droplets by spraying seawater into the air. The little droplets evaporate and leave behind salt crystals that increase the reflectiveness of low-lying clouds, which cools things down. Sounds easy enough, right? Well, nothing can be too easy. Generating enough of these droplets would require quite the spraying system, and once we have that, we still have to make sure it wouldn't cause unexpected issues for the rest of the planet. And what about those space-based mirrors? They sound pretty neat. The goal with these would be to reflect some of the solar radiation currently coming at the Earth, thus cooling things down a bit. This idea is still very much being developed, with several roadblocks to overcome, not the least of which is the cost and effort of transporting big mirrors to space. There's also stuff like controlling them once they're out there, protecting them from asteroids, and so on. So, we've got some cool options, no pun intended, and we weren't even able to cover all of them here. Lots of these still need considerable development, but in researching this, we found hope in the innovative ideas out there. And to bring this back into our wheelhouse, we wrote a whole episode about climate technologies because finding ways to reduce global warming is absolutely critical for public health. We all face threats from several directions on a warming planet, with some of us paying a higher price than others. Our health depends on the health of our planet, and we need to make every effort possible to address the climate crisis. Hey, to enjoy this episode, you might enjoy this previous episode on a public health approach to climate change. We'd appreciate it if you'd like the video and subscribe to the channel down there and consider going to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help support the show, make it bigger and better. We'd like to especially thank our research associates, Joe Sevitz and Edward Lillaholm, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam. <laughs>